as one approaches, as one approaches building a message, by the way, this is all for free. As one approaches building a message, one absolutely requires, for the longest time, I'm going to tell you now that there was a guy down in Indiana, his name was Jack Hiles, and he had one of the biggest churches in America. He had a Sunday school with 100,000 people in it, and he was the envy of every Baptist preacher in America. Oh, look at this, and he's got all this property, all these people, all this ministry, blah, 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 bigger and bigger and bigger. And bigger. And I'll say that there was nothing wrong with Jack Hiles' approach that we should win people to Jesus, that we should be soul winners, that we should be looking for opportunities to say, to speak a word for the one who redeemed us. Jesus is wonderful, is he not? Indeed he is. We should not be afraid to say so. Don't be afraid to say, if people don't appreciate it, it's not my problem. It's their problem, it's not my problem. So we need to do that. He was correct in that one thing, but then his approach to preaching was, it's a greasy wrench and I'm going to use it all the time on the people in my congregation. We have a term for that. You know what we call that? What do we call that, Brother Jim? You know what they call that? Shotgun preaching. He's doing this, so I'm going to pull my shotgun out, and bam, I'm going to blast away at him. Friends, that is not the way. It took me 30 years to learn that that is not the way messages are developed. This is not how you get a message from God to give to people. The message is here to fix you but not according to my perception of your problem. Perception is the big, is the big issue here. Who knows, who knows you better than anyone else? It actually isn't you. It's, a, it's actually your spirit, and when you are saved, your spirit and the spirit of God are joined together. Therefore, the Holy Spirit knows you better than anybody knows you. And it's his job to get you the correction that you need. It's not the preacher's job to it is not the preacher's job to correct you according to his perception. It is not his job to correct the problems in the church according to his perception. That is a that is the exact wrong approach to ministry. It's backwards. It's backwards vision. And he ruined about five generations of preachers in the process of doing it because nobody only a few men that I know would I trust to bring a message that I know came from God? Because it is a humbling thing to say, it's not my message. But then it's a humbling thing for a pastor to look, as, look at a church and say, it's not my church. Whose church is it? It's God's church. Amen? Amen? We've gotten this thing in ministry so backwards. for the, As fundamentalists, we've gotten this business of ministry so backwards for the last 50, 60 years I just, you know, sometimes you wonder if it's even worth rescuing it, you know. I'm a Baptist in, in the traditional sense of Baptist beliefs. If you want to you learn what Baptist beliefs are, you know my favorite place to find? Wiki. Wikipedia has the best list of Baptist beliefs that you'll ever see. One of the greatest of, of them all is soul liberty. Nobody ever wants to talk about soul liberty. Because that means that you worship God according to the knowledge that you have and according to your conscience, not according to anybody else's. That the church teachings are not necessarily the teachings of the Holy Spirit, but that God has the ability to show you things. Hey, one of the greatest of the Baptist distinctives is the priesthood of the believer. And by the way, folks, there are other religions that have some of these distinctives. Baptists just happen to have them all in one package as compared to a lot of places that have a couple here, a couple there. We've just had the package for a long, long time. And nobody, please, 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 do not tell me that Baptists go back to John the Baptist. Why anybody would want to pick an Old Testament prophet as the, as the foundation for your church is an absolute complete mystery to me. John the Baptist was not your New Testament Christian. John the Baptist is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets according to Jesus. I think I'll listen to him. Okay, modern Baptists only date back to the end of the of the 16th century. There's there's not they go back no further than that. I am so disturbed at the way people believe things and accept things without researching them. Listen, I'm going to do the I'm going to do according to the best of what I believe God has shown me to give you a message today. But it's not your job to accept it. 
it's your job to do what the Bereans did, to go back when you get home and examine the scriptures to see that those things are so. Our failure, the, fa the greatest failure in the ministry is to, has been a failure to develop people who have a certainty in their belief because their belief is based on scripture not based on what the pastor told them, not based on what the Sunday school teacher told them, not based on what the evangelist preached. My friends, real ministry involves knowing from the Holy Spirit of God what we should be doing. I spent far too many decades in places where my next, my next assignment was going to be what the greatest need of the pastor was. And because I was dedicated to the ministry, I would never say no. And it took me many years to learn the word no is a valid word. Because as God shows us our ministry, how he wants us to minister, people will come along and ask you to do things. Do not automatically say yes or no. I'm throwing this on you. I'm, I am teaching you today the best, as best as God will let me in for, the, for, what, for whatever he's got to work with, which ain't much, okay, that we have our responsibility to know what the Spirit of God is showing us, teaching us, and leading us. If you have a question in your mind about how that works, read the book of Acts. Because everywhere the disciples went, they came across issues, difficulties, problems, and opportunities. And in every circumstance, the Spirit of God when they consulted, when they went in prayer to the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God showed them where they were going to go and what they were going to do next. Yes, Anna? No, no, I'm just oh, you're just saying amen, huh? I just mean that I'm agreeing. Amen, amen. You can, you can say amen as well, too. We, don't, we do not care. We like, we like interaction. I like to know that everybody's awake and alive and all the other good things that you know, like come with being present in the moment. But the reality is that we, we, have, we, we as ministers of the gospel and me as a Sunday school teacher, one of, one of our great failures is we have not taught people how to listen to the Spirit of God or even to acknowledge the fact that he should be the one guiding us. Now I'm going to throw in a commercial for the local church for 10 seconds and say this is a great place to find ministries to be involved in. But the agreement has to be between you and the Holy Spirit that you are going to do so. There will be ministries outside the local church that the Holy Spirit will lead you to. He will put you in contact with people who will never be in the church. And it will be your job to do for them whatever it is that God tells you to do. We need to be, one of, the greatest, one of our greatest failings is that we have become formula, formulaic and, and mechanized in our approach to ministry. We don't we don't emphasize that every minute of our day belongs to who? God. Belongs to God. And when we're out of minutes, we're what? Well, then we're with him, right? <laughs> Sooner or later, we're going to run out of minutes. <laughs> That's just the reality. That's one of the great commonalities. We all have, as a human being, you have something in common with every other human being, birth and death. And death is the great equalizer, amen? It doesn't matter how much you accumulate between now and then. That's the great equalizer. There's no carrying things with you after you die. There is reward for those who have served Jesus faithfully, but there's no, what do they say? You never see a brink struck in a funeral procession. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't work that way. The Holy Spirit, we need him. I think we have a great, mis we have a great lack of understanding in this third person of the Godhead. How many people use the word Trinity? Stop using it. It's Godhead. Godhead is the word. Say what? That's right. If, you, if you're on Facebook and you want to know something, go look, go look at T.J. Lucas. He's a missionary. He's been a missionary to communist China. Interesting man. A little bit of a wild character and a friend of mine. And he does one of the better teachings on the Godhead. He talks about the Godhead. Listen. We always, we talk, about, we talk about God the Father because we love that he planned everything out so wonderfully, okay? He made the plans. He's the planning. He's the planner in this thing. He's the planner and the provider. He gets, he's got, he put, he put, he planned everything and set up everything so that God the Son could act and do the work of creation and do the work 
of redemption and do the work. So we have God, God the Father giving us the plan, being the mind and being the provider of all that's necessary. We have God the Son doing the work and being the action part of the Godhead. And then we have the Holy Spirit and we don't know what to do with him because he's confusing to us because his, his work and his person doesn't get what we call PR. Anybody know what I'm saying when I say PR? Public relations. I've often said it, I've said it many, many times before, Jesus needs better PR, amen? Needs better representation in the public. But the Holy Spirit, by his nature and his purpose, is not meant to be glorified. He is, he is, yes, he is a part of the Godhead. Yes, he is, he is a, a distinct entity in the Godhead. But he is almost like, you ever see, ever hear, ever hear the business term silent partner? That's kind of how he operates. He is not meant to be worshipped or glorified, and yet he is worthy of both in what he does for us, but it is not in his purpose. It's not in his makeup. It's not in his nature. We need that understanding because he is the least understood because he, he's been given a lot of speculation. People treat him as the force. They never see him as the person that he is. They see him as the force. And, really, and, and in reality, we see much more of his effect than we see of him. Jesus even said it. We should look at some of the things that he's called. Uh, wow, okay, Matthew 3.16. Uh, you don't have to go there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the scriptures to you, and if you want, I can, I can, I can print or send you all these, all these scripture references at Jesus, at Jesus' baptism, it says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and, lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. The Spirit of God is likened unto a dove. What are doves noted for? What are the two things that you, you, that you, that you take, the two characteristics of a dove? Love, what else? Peace, what else? Gentleness. Doves are not attack birds. They're not peregrine falcons. They're not eagles. Doves are birds of peace and gentleness. And that's, there's, do you think perhaps God had a reason for using a dove when he wanted to symbolize the third, the third person of the Godhead? Do you think he had a reason that he used the dove? Yes. Doves can be scared away, pushed away, ignored. You want to you get a dove to come to you, you have to be welcoming and open. That's how, that's how doves operate. Next we see the Spirit as empowering and liberating. In Luke 4, 18 it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. It's kind of interesting that Jesus is quoting, anybody know what passage I'm quoting there? That's an Old Testament passage I'm quoting, Isaiah 61.1, yeah. And it talks about, this is, this, is, this is the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus speaking of his own Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, empowering him to preach the gospel. The third person of the Godhead is where we gather our power. But we don't get, he's not, he's not the force, he's a person who accompanies us. And he was not easily, understanding this was not easy. By the way, Isaiah 61.1 was interesting. When Jesus, when Jesus reads that passage of scripture, he stops at recovering of sight to the, yeah, he stops at, he stops at to set at liberty them that are bruised. And there's a few more words at the end of Isaiah 61.1. I'm just going to go there for just a second because I want you to see that God is specific in his... In when, he, when God refers to something, he does so specifically. There's a comma here that's worth something, and I want you to see it. Go ahead, turn to Isaiah 61.1. You got a minute? Turn there. I print out all my sermons, therefore I print out all the scriptures so I don't normally spend my time... My time thumbing through the Bible, so it takes me time when I go off, as we say, off book. 
Isaiah 61 1 says this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives, to opening of the prison to them that are bound, verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus cuts off right before the day of vengeance of our God. He does that for a reason. He's separating the first coming from the second coming right there. He's not promising the Jews the kingdom right there. If you read the book of Acts and you look at the things that the Jews, that, that even the apostles were asking Jesus, will you establish the kingdom at this time? And he said, that's not for you to know. <laughs> the return, the first advent, the coming down to live as a man, to redeem us to live the perfect, perfect, sinless life that we cannot live and to offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the world is a separate event from the return and the vengeance and the payback, if you will. And by the way, it's not just payback. God, is, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It's just these are the conditions that were set. You met them or you didn't. And the opportunity was there for everybody. Look at, in Luke chapter 11, Jesus talks about our encounter with this third person of the Godhead. He says in verse 9, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. That's a promise from God, by the way, folks. If someone comes to you and has a question, you can say, you have a promise from God. If you will do this, then he will do that. You know, those that seek, they have something coming to them. Verse 11. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father Give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. There are times when we need to ask the Holy Spirit in that, as that third person of the Trinity to give us something, to help us, to guide us, to lead us. It's wild enough that he lives inside us. I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? You have the Holy Spirit living inside you. Isn't that something? Yeah. It's crazy enough, but, he all, but we also rely, we need to rely on him to, do our, to, to lead us and to guide us. Now, he is not, here's, here's the interesting part, as part of the Godhead, he is not limited by our, by, again, our perception. Our perception may be faulty. Our perception is limited. We're living on a very physical plane on a mud ball of a planet, okay? We're struggling our way through this mess of a life, and it's getting messier all the time. But the reality is that we are, what does the Bible say? We're seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. So positionally, we're better off than we are functionally, amen? <laughs> We're dealing with the ice and the snow and the COVID and the inflation and all the rest of it, but we're seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. We always have hope, my friends. We always got hope. Brother Jones, Brother Jones preaching on hope this morning. He did a good job, amen? Hope. That's one of the things we have to offer to this world, by the way, my friends. This world, there's a lot of people in this world that don't have hope. And here we have an opportunity to present hope. Let's go on a little bit further. The Holy Spirit is not... Limited by our perception. In John chapter 3, who's one, of the, who's one of the key characters in John chapter 3? He's a leader of the Jews. And his name is Nicodemus. And he comes to, he comes to Jesus and he starts, he starts actually soft-soaping him. Talks about, you know, you're a teacher, come from God. Jesus doesn't acknowledge any of the soft soap. He just looks at him answered and answered. And verse 3 it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And then Jesus gives him the answer. Verse 5. 
Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Hey, folks, anybody been around for the birth of a child? Yes, okay. Some of you have been there. Some of you ladies know what I'm talking about. What's one of the common events? Water. Yes, yes, there is, there, there is, there, there is water. Okay? I'm, I'm glad I was born of water. I'm here now. Amen. It says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He's telling him, your physical birth wasn't enough, my friend. You're going to need something else. That which is born, verse 6, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit, capital S, is Spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And here he says, in verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. We're following What's the expression? We're, we're, we're marching to the beat of a different drummer, my friends. Our perception is different. And the Holy Spirit himself is not subject to the perception of the unregenerate man. It's where the Bible talks about, it says, cannot receive the, things, the, 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 the lost man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually discerned. This is why, this is why people, lost people have such a hard time with the Bible. Lost people that are looking for their own answers can never get anything from the Bible. Those that are looking for God's answers can always get something because that's the, the job of the Spirit of God is to get you to that place, to get you to that. What is it? What have we just finished? The passage just finished. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, it'll be opened. It, that's why we have what we have. Amen? This is, this is our God. He's good to those who come seeking him Honestly. Honesty still matters, my friends. Honesty open, and op open-mindedness, not reaching a conclusion before God shows you the answer. That's important. Don't, don't run off until, you have, until you've done the research. Amen? Now, <clears throat> in this passage in John 3, we see his work in our salvation. His presence in us is our, is our entry into heaven. And it is he that brings the new birth. Our awareness or our understanding of the Spirit doesn't limit him, for just as the Father and the Son, he is co-equal in the Godhead. Jesus elaborates on this a little bit more in John 14. John 14, in verse 16, he says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. By the way, folks, this is an interesting point I want you to take, okay? The stuff that you see in the Gospels prior to the resurrection is prior to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. These are things that are being taught to Old Testament folks who do not have this understanding of the new birth. They do not have the understanding of the indwelling of the Spirit. Jesus has to explain this to them because it is not an Old Testament teaching. It's something new. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. By the way, folks, how long is forever? It, the, it's not, but folks, salvation is one and done. You throw yourself on the mercy and the grace of God, you're saved. The Holy Spirit will abide with you for how long? Forever. Now, does that mean you can do anything you want in this life? Well, actually you can, but you better be prepared to pay a price for it. <laughs> because there are certain things that can get you into a world of trouble in this life that in eternity will not count against, won't be counted against you in eternity. Jesus died for all sin. Your motivation, hopefully, will not be simply because you tremble and fear because you know that you know that your wickedness is going to get you into trouble i can guarantee your wickedness will get you into trouble i can tell i can tell you this it still won't terminate it doesn't terminate your contract salvation is one and done and the grace of god is an easy easy thing to access i spent years in what we call legalism where where the preacher could threaten you with the loss of your salvation to keep, to 
keep you in line. But folks, at the end of the day, that's not really how we need to be motivated. We need to be motivated by a desire to obey God. We need to be motivated by a desire that comes from the fact that we love him for who he is and for what he's done. Amen, sister. He's, he, who he is and what he's done is far more important than just worrying about somebody dropping the hammer on us. I mean, this isn't like, this isn't like uh, the Road Runner and Wiley Coyote. You don't have to worry about the anvil falling on you, right? Acme Anvil Company is not part of the equation here. You're going to have, you, you trust Jesus, you come, to, you, come to, you come to trust Jesus, he's with you forever. And our motivation now has to be to love, to glorify, and to serve. And if we will listen to the Holy Spirit of God, we will see the place of our service. Now, I got 11 pages of notes here, okay? How far do you think we're going to page? We're not, we're, we're, half, we're not even halfway down page two. We're going to have some fun. Amen? I, don't, I, 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 can, I sincerely doubt they're going to make it all the way to possibly, I'm going to tell you right now. You can write this down. If you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. Romans 8 gives us the greatest discourse on the Holy Spirit. And the entire book of Galatians gives us the rundown on learning to walk in the Spirit. Write that down if you want to, because those are passages that when you, are in, when you find the, that, the, that you need to understand the Holy Spirit, them's the places that I have the longest discourses on, what, on what he, who he is, what he does, and how we need to work with him. Amen? Now, back there in John 14, after Jesus says, he will abide with you forever, in verse 17 he says, even the spirit of truth, Folks, I want to I reiterate this thing. Truth is still the most important thing. Is, is your, truth is your greatest asset, your greatest weapon, and your greatest defense. Truth matters. The spirit of truth. Look at what it says in verse 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Jesus is making a wild promise here. The, 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 I can see it right now. The apostles are going, what is he talking about? This is beyond their perception and beyond their understanding. Doesn't change the fact that that's how the Holy Spirit lives inside them. Amen? Doesn't change the fact that when they receive the Holy Spirit following the resurrection, that's how it operates. Whether they, You don't have to understand how he does it for him to do it. Amen? Our perception is limited. God's is not. I want to go back on this business of truth. I have mentioned, I have mentioned to Dr. Hiles from Hammond, Indiana. He used to tell the most... By the way, folks, this is why I get really, I don't like the storytelling preachers. That's another thing he taught people to do. He taught people to entertain your congregation by telling them these great stories. And he would tell all these fabulous, entertaining, wild stories about his fabulous soul winning experiences and how he met people and how they got saved and all this. Come to find out, it was fabrication. It was a story cut from whole cloth. The events never happened. They were just done so that he could, it was just, he just said it so he would have the ears of the people. He just, listen, I don't want to lie, if you need me to lie to you to inspire, to, to inspire you to do something for Jesus, one of us, or both of us, has a real problem. Years later, I mentioned this to someone that I, I mentioned this to a, to, a, to a fellow that I knew and had been gone to church with for many, many years. And I said, he's lying. And he said, he's not lying. That's puppet speech. So, it's, oh, you, hate, you should tell the truth everywhere except when you stand behind the pulpit. <laughs> My friends, this is not the spirit of truth. 
This is not how the Spirit of God operates. He doesn't operate in lies. He operates in truth. Being truthful is a very, very important part. Listen, when people ask you a question and you have an uncomfortable answer to give them, give them the uncomfortable answer if it's the truth, because the truth is more You People who tell the truth don't have to have a great memory. <laughs> People who are going to lie have to have terrific memories because they have to, they have to remember what they told someone. Uh, did I tell them this? No, no just, just tell the truth. Even if it hurts, just tell the truth. And get it over with because, listen, he is known, the Holy Spirit is known as the spirit of truth. You know why you don't hear him? You don't, you don't know a great deal about him because he doesn't. His job was never to glorify himself. Now, Jesus had to explain this indwelling concept. It's a new concept for them, and it's beyond the experience of the disciples. I don't have a, listen, I don't have a deep understanding of how the Holy Spirit slash Holy Ghost operated in the Old Testament because I don't live there. I'm a, I am what you call a dispensationalist. I believe that God dealt with people in certain different ways in certain different times, made certain promises to them for certain, to certain groups of people for certain things, Salvation is separate from that. Salvation is always is is now and always has been by the grace of God. No man has ever been able to if you believe that you in your efforts in your flesh can add one thing to your salvation, one thing to what Jesus has done, you are mistaken. Jesus paid we have that song Jesus paid it all. It's not us. It's him. It's what he's done. And folks, I don't care if it's Old Testament, New Testament. I don't care if it's under the law. I don't care if it's right after you get kicked out of the garden. I don't care if it's in the theocratic kingdom. Your eternity will never be based on your works. It will be based on what he's done. You either, believed the, you either lived in the Old Testament and believed in the promise of the coming Redeemer or you live in the New Testament where we look back to having been redeemed. Amen? There are conditions of blessing. Were you promised? Was the church promised Jerusalem? A, a, a promised land in Palestine? No. That belongs to a different economy, a different set of conditions, and a different set of promises. Salvation's one thing. Conditions of blessing... Promises, different stuff. Okay? Don't ever, don't ever confuse the two. It's like, self, like I was reading something on Facebook. What's your favorite Facebook meme? The one where it says, you need Jesus to go to heaven. And underneath it says, bro, you need Jesus to go to Walmart. <laughs> when I look, when, when we look at, we look at, at the, at, the, at the mess that the world is in today. Brother Jones, Brother Jones hit this thing. It's, it's all about hope. And it's all about the Holy Spirit living in us has given us a lively hope. The Holy Spirit living in us has quickened our spirit. Literally, huh? you need a definition for the word quickened? Made alive. Try to remember that. It's the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us, joined with our spirit, and now knows everything about our spirit, knows us better than we know, our, he knows us better than we know ourselves, it is him that has made us alive. And, it, and here's the great crazy promise that I, that I kind of hang on to from time to time, and I like it, it says, it, even our mortal bodies have been quickened. So if you're feeling a little down, ask for a little more quickening, amen? The Holy Spirit lives in you. Say, how about a little help here, a little more light? <laughs> Could use a little more lively right now. <laughs> Jesus had to explain the indwelling of the Spirit because, in, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians 3.16 it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. We're relying on him for teaching, for guidance, to show us truth, to lead us into, to lead us towards what, folks, if you want, like as, as, as I said earlier, if you read the book of Acts, 
And you look at how the apostles did these things and how they were guided by the Holy Spirit to do, to do things. They, they relied, listen folks, they did not have, they did not have all, here we go. It's almost a third, it's almost a third of the Bible. Here we are, here's the, here's the New Testament, right? Here's the New Testament right here. And here's what, they, here, here's what they had, the Old Testament. Here's what we got, the New Testament, but it explains all this stuff. They, they didn't have all that. There was, an, a, there was, in the early church, a deep reliance on the Holy Spirit to bring them into truths that had not yet been written down. Folks, do you wonder why there were interesting things occurring in the book of Acts and in the early church and they had, they had the healings and they had the, had the miracles and had all this? You know, part, part of that, there's two, there's two reasons for that. One of the reasons is that the Jew is entitled to a sign. And God doesn't really, God never shuts the door on the Jew. The Jews shut the door on themselves. You want to read about it, it's in Acts chapter 16 when Paul, and I forget who was with him at the time, I don't remember if it's Silas or Barnabas that's with him. He had two traveling companions through the book of Acts. And, they, and the Jews are just, because the Gentiles are being included in the preaching, they're just, they're, they're flipping out and they're like, well, you know, like, you know, they start dissimulating, dissembling, and causing problems in the meeting. And Paul and I think it was Silas, look, they're like, okay, look, we're done, we're done, we're done. If you don't count yourselves worthy of eternal life, we're going to the Gentiles, okay? We're done with this. We're not playing this game anymore. They walk away at that point in time. And the church from that point forward focuses on not the Jewish nation, but the Gentiles. And there's a little... And, and now, for what it's worth, if you've, been, if you've been studying the scriptures and looking, you look at the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God... And you're going to see that there's a little transitioning going on here because the kingdom promises given to Israel are not the same kingdom promises given to the church. That's the kingdom of heaven. We're in the kingdom of God. They're different because they're spelled different and the words mean different things. When you see a word in the Bible and it's different from another word in the Bible, the reason that it's different is because there's a different meaning. Do not assume that things mean the same for they do not. God was very specific in giving us the scriptures. Jesus himself said, the scriptures cannot be broken. Having a little debate, having a little debate online with a fellow about eternal security. Okay? I know that, I know once, listen, after I stopped listening to people, the apostles of doubt who were trying to control me by holding my salvation, look, you're going to lose it if you don't do what we say. Folks, that's the mark of a cult. And there are churches in this country, there are churches in this city, and there are churches in this county that are cults because of the way they manipulate and use people. Not according to the Spirit of God, not according to the Scriptures, but it's a handy thing to have if you're trying to get people to do something. Folks, we'll all be rewarded for our works at the judgment seat of Christ. Good works will, be, will bring reward. Bad works will lose us reward. But the, but the reality is the greatest reward will come when, we've, when we have done things through the Spirit of God, in the power of God, motivated by a love for God, not being coerced, manipulated, or forced. This is why we, as believers, need to understand as much as we can, because nobody understands everything about God, as much as we can about the leading of the Spirit and the guiding of the Spirit and being able to listen to the Spirit of God as we walk through this life. We should not be afraid to ask for his guidance. He's not going to be... And we're, not even, we're not even scratching the surface of the stuff that I've got here. Maybe at some point in time we can come back, revisit it a little bit, and have a little bit more fun with it. But the reality is that he does not get the glory for things. And folks, one of the greatest lessons in the Christian life is don't seek for glory. The Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm not, let me see if I can find, let me see if I can find that passage. Oh yeah, here it is. 
John chapter 16, I want you to go there. I can't hold you hostage much longer. I've got to get you out of here. John chapter 16. <clears throat> and Jesus is talking again about the Holy Spirit as comforter. And folks, when we pray for folks, we need to pray that God will comfort them. We're asking the Holy Spirit to do something for them. Amen? We're asking the third person of the Godhead to do something for them. And folks, there's a lot of people in this world that need comfort. You want to talk, you want to hear some sad stories? Come here on a Tuesday night. That's, that's my party. Tuesday night's my party. You come here on a Tuesday night, that's my party, okay? This is where I'm hanging with my peeps, all right? And there's some sad stories that you hear. I mean, we've all got, listen, we've all got our troubles. But if you think living poor in Buffalo is easy, let me assure you, it is not. It's got, it, it's tough. It's a tough town. So in, so in, John, where am I now? Where did I, where, John 16, yes. So in verse 7, Jesus starts telling, telling you about the Holy Spirit and his ministry to us and through us. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. When we have the Spirit, when we have the Holy Spirit, we have the Spirit of Christ. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He is the operating system now that is drawing the world to Jesus. They can fight him. When he appears, he appears as a what? Dove. They want to push him away, they can push him away. He's not, he's not, the, he's not like the devils that try to possess people. He's the Spirit of God who works gently. Verse, verse 9, Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Why? Because at this point, I don't have the new birth. I do not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But we'll get there, Amen. Verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Verse 14 is where I want you to put, perk up your ears. He shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. The Holy Spirit is not meant to be glorified in himself. His purpose is to be in the background and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. God is not, listen, our purpose is to glorify God. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Go ahead, turn there. While you're turning to Revelation 4.11, let me quote you 1 Corinthians 4.7, or I'll just summarize it for you. In 1 Corinthians 4.7, there's an interesting passage about receiving praise. Did you know that it's not correct for a pastor to receive or a preacher to receive a compliment on his preaching? On his preaching. You, you shouldn't compliment your preacher on his preaching, and he shouldn't take it if you do. I was, in, I was in fundamental churches for 35 years before I heard the first message on 1 Corinthians 4 7. 35 years. Because they were, oh, Pastor, what a great message. Oh, preacher, what a, what a, oh, your message is such a blessing to me. Oh, preacher, oh, yeah, it's just wonderful. Thank you so much. No, that's not the Bible. In the Bible, you either got the message from God and He gets the credit. Or you got the message from you, and you shouldn't have said it. This is how serious our business of listening to the Holy Spirit is, particularly when you're in a position of teaching or preaching. It's not, we're not supposed to take the credit, my friends. Listen, Revelation 
Thou art worthy. By the way, let's, let's take a look. Here's the heavenly scene. There's four and twenty elders in verse 10. Who, who knows who those are? You don't know who the four and twenty elders are in Revelation chapter 4? The twelve apostles and the twelve patriarchs. Here you go. Okay. You shouldn't. Don't anybody in here read Revelation? First book of the Bible I ever read. I wanted to see how it ended. That was 50 years ago. <laughs> The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Our business is to please God. Our business is to bring him glory and not be glorified in ourselves. And this is how the Holy Spirit works. He brings glory and honor to God the Father and God the Son. And he takes how much of the credit? None of it! He's the unseen, the unseen hand, the unseen, the, 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 the what did I say, the silent partner in this equation. Knowing him is important to us. Knowing him how he operates is important in teaching us how we are to operate. Not taking credit. I don't, I don't, listen. Paul, the Apostle Paul was a pretty cool dude. And he was a pretty good Christian. I'm telling you right now, as far as, as, far as people who've done stuff, the Apostle Paul, he's a cool dude, man. You know, everybody's going to want to be rubbing elbows with him up in heaven. Paul, Tell us about this. Tell us about that. Tell us about that time you were stoned. Tell us about that time you were shipwrecked. Tell us about that time the snake came out of the fire and bit you. Tell us about... A lot of people are going to want... Listen, I'm going to be one of those people. And the Apostle Paul himself said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. You know what your greatest, you know what your greatest asset as a believer is going to be? Humility. Having a proper image. When we have a proper image of ourselves, what we are, what good is in us, and how good is manifested through us, not because of us, but because of him. Humility becomes the greatest asset that you'll ever have in ministry. You'll be able to do things that you won't believe because God does stuff that's unbelievable. Amen?